slavery. That's the place everybody likes to start Negro history. You have ignorant black men being brought over from Africa in chains. Terrible thing, slavery. But this way slavery is taught, it sort of takes the sting out of it. Because the way it's usually taught, people think that we Afro-Americans started with nothing but little grass skirts like the cats in the Tarzan movies. And though America gave us slavery, America kindly gave us religion and a lick or two of education. And when we get more jobs and more education, then up from slavery. But uh, we had something before we left Africa, something more than rhythm. I mean, we had a high culture. The culture was so high that uh, great artists in the world are still borrowing from it. Now, here's a sculpture by an unknown African artist. And here's what Paul Clay took from him. Now, here's a work by an unknown black African. And Pablo Picasso liked what he saw. Another African design, and Modigliani swiped it. Or he was influenced by it, or whatever polite word you want to use. Another black African artist, and Picasso didn't change it very much. I mean, when you look at this copy, you got to give us a little more than rhythm. You got to give us style. Now, if you tell the history of slavery right, you got a big problem on your hands. The slave trader didn't take some savage out of Africa. He took a human being. He sold him like an animal and separated him from his family. America invented the cruelest slavery in the history of the world because it broke up black families. After slavery was over, America kept breaking up the black man's family. And that's some awful history to teach. Now, if you want to look history right straight in the eye, you're going to get a black eye. Because it isn't important whether a few black heroes got lost or stolen or strayed in America's history textbooks. What's important is why they got left out. Now, this country has got a psychological history. There was a master race, and there was a slave race. And though there isn't any political slavery anymore, those same old attitudes have hung around. I mean, the burning part of burn, baby, burn, is right here in this classroom. We want to thank Mrs. Lovely Billups and the whole gang here at fourth grade for the brilliant and intelligent artwork that uh, they've done here to make this whole broadcast sing. I want you guys to keep pretending that I'm not here. You're doing a great job and just, uh, Keep on drawing and reading and writing, doing what you have to do, because I'm going to talk about some other kids. Not you, Mary, John, and Bob. These are kids from other schools. Uh, did you know in some states it used to be against the law to teach blacks to read or write? Nowadays, we're getting these integrated school rooms, and most people think that if we get enough teaching and enough jobs, everything is going to take care of itself. But there is a scar of history running right through kids as young as these. It tears you up if you know how to look at drawings kids make because kids shouldn't know much about history and anything about discrimination. I mean, nobody hates little black kids, but why do some of them cause so much trouble? And if you ask black and white children to draw themselves or trees or houses, some strange things happen. We ask some ordinary white kids from ordinary families to make some drawings for us. Like, well, let's call him John. John's white, and we asked him to draw himself. This is John. This is his house, and this is his tree. Then we asked a black kid, let's call him Ralph, to do the same thing. This is Ralph's drawing of himself. This is his tree. Now, why should two kids of the same age draw so differently? Enter the expert. This is Dr. Emanuel Hammer, psychiatrist specializing in children's therapy. Well, let me illustrate it for you. Let's take these drawings. No matter what a child draws, he's really picturing himself. Ask a secure child to draw a tree, and he's likely to draw a bountiful spreading tree. A black child drew this tree, cut off in its growth, stark, bare, ungratified. It works the same way with drawings of people, normal children, average drawings. The mood is happy, the child feels capable, the drawings are complete and the arms are developed to emphasize strength. 
These children were old enough to draw complete figures. The significant fact is what they left out. Arms, hands. A child may sense that a situation in life is so powerless that he himself is equivalent to an armless man. My own study reveals that armless people appear three times more frequently in the drawings by black children than those by white. The faceless beings suggest that these youngsters not only feel themselves to be less than they might be, they don't even feel themselves to be. The black child who is forced to live in a hostile world may disappear in self-defense. He drifts through life feeling like a shadow. He stops caring and he stops trying. A child who has this on his mind cannot be a child. A child who has this on his mind could want to burn down cities when he gets older. The whole confusion was summed up by a black nine-year-old in these two paintings. This is a nine-year-old boy who draws a white man, Robin Hood maybe. And this is how the same boy draws himself. And this is the consequence of deformed history.